to record that. Um, actually, that's a, that's a good reminder. So Zoom has this very handy live transcript, which can be really useful when, when people speaking, such as me, don't have a local accent, <laughs> which makes us a little harder to understand, I suspect. Um, and yes, yeah, it's, it's just kind of a, a good thing to have. So yeah, so, so we'll run through um, win of the month today. I learned some announcements. And then for our topic of the day, Annette is here and will tell us a bit about uh, sharing and managing and publishing data at NERSC. Uh, then we'll kind of have a quick look at uh, some things that are coming up and also a quick look at um, some numbers from last month. So our uh, first topic is win of the month. And this is an opportunity to show off an achievement or shout out somebody else's achievement that you're aware of. And, and these can be big or small from, yeah, I, think, I think last month, somebody had a paper accepted to nature, which, which is huge. Um, it could also be, you know, just solved, solved a bug that had been giving some, yeah, giving you some grief for, for a while. And, uh, yeah, some, some tips on how you, how you solved it would be very interesting, I think, to people here. Uh, it might be a scientific achievement, and some of those can be candidates for um, a science highlight. So NERSC uh, sends, uh, publishes and sends to Department of Energy every, every month or a quarter a collection of uh, highlights of scientific work that's been done using NERSC uh, resources. Um, and also we have an annual High Impact Scientific Achievement Award and Innovative Use of High Performance Computing Award. Uh, and in fact, I think each of those has uh, two categories for uh, early, early career researchers as well as for uh, more established researchers. Uh, would anybody like to kick us off with uh, uh, an achievement or a, or a win in the last month? I want to give a shout out to Rebecca Hartman Baker for um, the crash course in supercomputing. That was a superb training. Ah, that's good to hear. So that was, I think, uh, Tuesday. Um, that that was just just this week. Um, so yeah, it's good to good to hear that you found it uh, valuable. Um, I learned yeah, about uh, PyOMP that day, which is awesome. I think bringing OpenMP to uh, Python. That is interesting, actually. I haven't haven't uh, stumbled across that one myself. Um, I'm curious how does it how does it do it in terms of the actual OpenMP because Python is famously uh, challenging around multi-threaded applications because of its um, global uh, global interpreter lock. It looks like it uses number to generate LLVM code. Ah, yep. That's, that's a fairly uh, clever approach. So yeah, I think uh, Rebecca's actually not on at the moment, but I'll, yeah, I'll pass that on. Um, let's let's uh, move across to the kind of the flip side of that coin, which uh, uh, which is a you know, today I learned and this is an opportunity to talk about things that weren't necessarily wins, um, something that surprised you that might uh, benefit others to know about, and and this can be something that didn't work, like you know, discovering what doesn't work is quite important and valuable. Um, dead ends, difficulties, and, you know, if it's a, if it's a still ongoing difficulty, it might be that uh, somebody here has a, has an idea of uh, yeah, what you can try next. Um, it can also be a, a tip that you've learned recently. So in a way, what uh, Will was speaking about just now with um, being able to use 
PyOMP to get uh, OpenMP from Python uh, programs is a, a pretty good tip. Already got uh, something to call out on that front. So I actually stumbled across something recently. There's, there's more kind of HPC adjacent. Um, I, was, I was using it for, for a HPC related project, but it's not directly HPC, which is, um, you may have heard of mermaid diagrams. So mermaid is a kind of a, a markdown like um, you know, markup type language that's fairly easy to write. And uh, I think it uses something like graph is in the background, but uh, so you can write kind of you know, text descriptions of a, of a diagram, like a, you know, a flow chart or a class diagram or an architecture diagram, you know, uh, that you know, network diagram. Um, and it will you know, generate a graph of it. Um, the particular example I was actually trying to generate in this case was a, was a Gantt chart, which is one of its things that it does. But what I learned is that you can use these diagrams and, and it's got a, a clause called click. And so you can make elements clickable. And if you open that in a markdown capable notebook, or at least certain markdown capable notebooks, Obsidian was the one I was playing with, uh, you can actually make a, a kind of a, you know, a graphic or a flowchart or an architecture diagram click on the elements of it and jump to essentially a wiki page that you've set up about that, which, which I thought was a really neat way of, uh, you know, navigating the documentation and architecture of a project. So that's, that's, that's my little today I learned just recently. Any other, uh, tips or lessons that people might want to pass on. A little bit uh, quiet this week. That's, that's okay. There is. There uh, were uh, plenty of maintenances after all this week. There, there were a few maintenances actually in the last in the last few weeks, actually, I haven't I haven't looked too closely at um, this month's ones yet. But uh, for for last month's numbers, I'm having a look at previous month's ones. So yeah, we did have a a few things sort of coming up and down. So I think what we're uh, yeah something we're what well, we're we're clearly learning more and more about how to uh, run Perlmutter, how to how to set up and run Perlmutter effectively, and these uh, maintenance are sort of you know building out more of the you know the, the the software stack in the system setup um we have kind of a bunch of announcements and and various calls for participation in things uh some were in the most recent uh weekly emails so we've got a few that we can call out here and yeah there'll be a chance in a in a moment to um add to them first and, and i think this is uh, also starts to you know, fall a little bit into the the, the wit of the month. I, I thought this was a, a great progress. And I see uh, Kuchi is here to sort of uh, uh, celebrate. He was the, the one who um, really kicked this off. Uh, so NUG now has a special interest group, particularly for uh, WARF users. So WRF is uh, weather research and forecasting application. It's a you know a fairly important application. We have a, a quite a number of um, users at NERSC use it. It's also you know famously tricky to you know set up and get running right. And this is uh, uh, setting up a, a seek for it is part of an effort to um, enable NERSC users to be able to to collaborate more in ways that are. Yeah, kind of yeah, generally uh, uh, helping other nurse users in a way, and uh, yeah, expand the, the the ability to make good use of nurse resources beyond just uh, sending tickets. You know, find uh, you know, domain expertise that's relevant to particular things, and so the um, Wolf Sig is uh, uh, effort in that direction, and it had a, a kickoff, and so it's, it's uh, coming along quite nicely and uh, there's a, a little bit more detail in the weekly email announcing that but on the nug slack 
if you look in the browse channels, there's a, a WRF user that has some more information. Uh, another announcement just in the last few weeks um, that's also in the nurse in, in the uh, weekly email is that we have uh, Federated ID has rolled out a little bit further. So it's not to all institutions yet, but it's to most DOE labs. So uh, particularly if you're at a DOE lab, you'll see when you go into the single sign on for NERSC, uh, a screen that looks a little bit like, like this one over here, um, where you can choose your institution and log in with your login from your home institution, kind of as an alternative to logging in at NERSC. Basically, you know, it works for most NERSC web services. Um, yeah, so it's, it's not for the SSH login, but for things like um, uh, Jupyter and uh, ServiceNow and, and so on like that. So it's quite handy, especially if you're in multiple institutions, you know, one less password to remember. You can use your institutional logon. It's, uh, I think, a little more secure because of that as well. Uh, we have, you may have seen a couple of announcements in emails about the NERSC machine learning users survey. Um, please fill this out if you haven't, and well, particularly if the work that you do uses machine learning, uh, this is to help us to optimize Perlmutter and future systems for ML capability and performance. Oops. Uh, a number of calls for participation out at the moment. The Smoky Mountains Data Challenge, which is hosted by um, Oak Ridge, if I remember correctly, is now accepting or has a, has a CFP out. Um, the George Michael Memorial HPC Fellowship uh, nominations are uh, open and actually uh, falling due fairly soon at the end of this month. Uh, and that one's accepting self nominations. So this is for PhD students doing HPC related research. So if you are a PhD student or have a PhD student who uh, this year might be applicable to, yeah, go uh, take a look. Um, you know, it comes with uh, uh, you know, a certain amount of money as well as you know, recognition in uh, ACM and uh, uh, expenses for SE22 as well as uh, yeah, there's an award involved so you taken up in uh, publicly recognized on the stage there. Uh, the third international symposium on checkpointing for supercomputing is also uh, looking for papers of participation at the moment. That, uh, if I remember rightly, that one is held in conjunction with supercomputing so in November. Uh, a few training events coming up. There's a spin-up workshop starting next week. Um, there's a, work, uh, a tutorial with uh, NVIDIA on profiling deep learning applications using NVIDIA Insight, I think that one's um, with NVIDIA uh, at the end of this month. Um, there's also a tutorial on coordinating dynamic ensembles of computations with lib ensemble. So this is kind of a you know, ensemble, not quite the same as a workflow if I understand it correctly, uh, manager, but uh, you know, a way of managing um, ensembles of simulations. Uh, so that's the ones that we know about. Are there any others that people would like to announce? If not, then we can go on to our topic of the day and we're slightly ahead of schedule, which is probably a good thing because I think Annette has a, a, a bit to tell us about. Um, Annette, would you like to share a screen? Sure. I think I need you to stop sharing first. There we go. Let's see how well this comes through. Does that look great? It's looking good. Okay. You you don't have the issue that I had. I, I don't see yeah, that. I don't know what, <laughs> what's going on with yours. <laughs> Pretty strange. All right. Um, so I was just going to talk about data sharing at NERSC in all its various forms and give people some pointers about how to do it. Um, let's see. Get my next slide up. 
So um, what I'm going to cover is some notes on permissions and how they work. Some of you will know this pretty well already, but I think it bears pointing out a few tips that relate to them. Um, and I'll talk about internal data sharing within NERSC, either within a project or outside a project. And then I'll talk a bit about external data sharing and sharing through science gateways or just transferring data. So starting out with notes on permissions. So people are probably pretty well acquainted with the user group and other uh, permissions that you see in a file directory when you do ls minus l. Um, one thing to note, though, that actually still is a concern. Yeah, it's one of the, the more common issues that comes up when somebody has trouble trying to figure out how to share a file is that only the owning, owning user can actually change the permissions on a file or directory. So even if your, your directory is, is writable by people in a group, those people still can't change the permissions. Um, so within a group, uh, your, your default group, uh, when you're creating a new file on the system, it's just going to get your name as, as the group name. Um, but of course, you can be part of many different groups. And this is one of the simpler, most expedient ways of sharing a file with people at NERSC. Does, um, um, the, does NERSC support set UID on the, on the group so you can have the yes. group automatically set? OK. Yes. And in fact, your, your project directory should have that automatically enabled to start with. Um, but you may need to kind of add that to directories below that. Um, and so others on the system, um, of course, you know, one way to, to share if somebody isn't already in a group that you have in common, um, you could make something uh, just available to others. But of course, you need to keep in mind that when you're doing that, you're, you're sharing it with everyone on the system, not just the people that you're thinking of as your collaborators. Um, so of course, you know, the Unix permissions are kind of a combination of who the users and groups are that are actually the owners of the file and then the modes that are set for each of them. And those are the little RWX and friends that we see in LS minus L. Um, and just to note, you know, when you're setting these things on a directory, the behavior is just a little bit different from when you're putting it on a regular file. Whereas the, the, the plus X isn't just making it executable, it, it means it's it's making the directory executable, which just means that you can traverse it. Um, and because that is actually the function of a directory. Um, and then plus R means that you can run LS on it. So you can actually see the content while you're working through it. So at NERSC, uh, we like to, to try to remind people to remember the principle of least privilege when you're sharing things. Um, you want to make sure that you're you're sharing with people who really need to, to be able to see it. Um, and so it's always good to uh, just to make sure that anything that needs to be kept private is kept private. And so if you do set up specific directories that you have more open permissions than the default, it's a good idea to set up an area where you have your own private stuff that has the permissions where the group and other um, do not have read, write, and execute, and do not have any of those so that you can you just know that that's locked down. And then you can set up separate directories that, that have the sharing permissions that you want. And remember when you're doing this, um, you know, it's, it's kind of easy to, to just open up a directory and open up, you know, the contents that make the files in there readable and shareable with other people and forget that they have to be able to get there. So don't open the door, but still close the road and let people find their way to the files. Um, so making those directories executable all along the path allows people to traverse them. And then if you made it readable and executable, you allow people to actually kind of see, look around as they're going through so they can actually move into a directory, see what else is there. So depending on, on your need, you may want to do one or the other. So and it, that seems like a, a fairly neat tip. Does it mean that if I want to share a specific file or a specific subdirectory, but not, but the, the sort of deeper in my home directory, but not the things behind it, I can use just plus X, give them the full path to the file mm -hmm. and they can get to that, but yeah, but it doesn't give them access to all the directories underneath it. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And then with, that comes up a lot in web sharing, which I'll talk about later, where people will need to share a specific directory uh, so that the web server can get to it. And the web server will need to be able to traverse those, but it doesn't need to be able to look at what's inside it. 
Okay, and the other thing is we just mentioned uh, from that previous question, uh, the set GID on a directory. So this preserves the group ownership so that when, when somebody creates a new file or directory inside a directory that has this bit set, um, that ends up having the correct group. It shares the, the same group name. Um, so that, that helps keep the, the shared directories accessible. Um, of course, one thing that happens over time is a lot of times people will forget to set that. Look, maybe create a new directory, uh, and maybe it's a couple layers below where you had that S bit set. Um, so you might need to do something to just kind of bring things along and catch everything up to having the, the permissions that you want the group to have. And Nurse has this handy little script called Make Dir Group Writable, and you can give it a group name and you can give it a list of directories and it will go through and it will set the right group name. It will set the right uh, permissions on there, you know, make it all group readable and it will um, set the S bit as well. So it makes sure that the things are all ready to, uh, to help you maintain that setting going forward. And then uh, just to mention also another piece of the equation is the UMask, which is um, basically the settings for when you create a new file or directory. Um, this in conjunction with the, the system defaults, which are kind of like, uh, you can think of it as the UMask is sort of like subtraction from what the, the defaults are. The defaults at NERSC are gonna be um, basically for full permissions for a directory and just read and write permissions for a file. So uh, that they can be changed, but it's uh, usually you're not gonna wanna try to worry too much about that because it's sort of complicated uh, with compute nodes, compute nodes, but we do have um, some extra uh, documentation about how to handle this as well. Um, and in fact, we have a lot of documentation about Unix file permissions on the docs.nersc.gov website. So it's a good place to go for more info about that. All right, let's look at sharing uh, within NERSC uh, within a specific project. So obviously the permissions are something that I just mentioned. Um, another piece of the puzzle can be setting a specific Unix group for a project um, when you have a project that, that's just coming online at NERSC, you'll end up having a project directory assigned to it. Um, some groups find that they need to set up an additional project directory for sharing. And this is something that can be done on request. Um, and, you know, basically these end up being a project directory on the community file system. And once those are in place, a PI can make changes on their own to the setup there. So. Uh, the PI toolbox will allow a PI to go in and reset the ownership and the permissions on specific files. Uh, can be any file in their project. It doesn't have to be one that they own. So this is a little extraordinary because usually on a Unix system, you can only change uh, what's what's owned by you. Um, but we have this special facility for PIs to go in and make those kind of changes. And then uh, if you need to create and manage new Unix groups, you can do that using Iris. All right, so for sharing outside of a project, um, again, you can use permissions to do that, um, but be, you know, be careful about how much you're opening up because remember not everybody on the system is necessarily the ones you're thinking of when you set these permissions. Um, but there's also a very nice facility um, called give and take, and these are just, two commands that allow you to give a file to somebody else um, or to take it from somebody else. Um, you can only take what's been given to you. Uh, so if somebody uh, gives a file to you, they just specify the recipient and the file, and then you go in and to take it, you have to know who's giving it to you. And you can do the minus A, which will just grab everything that that person is trying to give you. You don't have to remember the file names. Um, or you can use the more uh, lengthy version of it and you can tell it a specific location in which you want your copy of that to be landed. So that is sharing within NERSC. Now let's look at outside of NERSC. 
So um, starting out looking at, at file transfers, pretty much anytime anyone is trying to share data uh, by transferring it to somebody else, we're going to recommend that they try Globus first because Globus is a really, really well put together system. Uh, it's very performant. It can handle failures and recover from them. And it's built to move large files. So it works really, really well for most use cases, um, pretty much every use case around here. Um, so Globus is great. Um, another thing that's great uh, is the, the data transfer notes. We use those particularly because they are set up to have the right configuration for um, moving data. And so you know, they mount all of our file systems, they're optimized for allowing uh, data to move efficiently. So please take advantage of those. Uh, let's see, uh, tools for file transfer, you're probably pretty familiar with SCP, the secure copy command, uh, just using SSH to move a file. Um, you may be less familiar with BBCP, which is just the, uh, I think that stands for a BABAR copy. Uh, this is built by the High Energy Physics Committee, I mean, community, uh, and, and it works like SCP, but it it's more robust and built to work with large files. And finally, we don't really generally recommend it, but we do have an FTP upload service um, that occasionally ends up being kind of the last the last way to, to move files. Like if, if you have a collaborator who is not a nurse user and doesn't have a way to use Globus, then that may be the, the way to go. Uh, we are working on a replacement for that. And uh, we also just like people to, to try to find alternatives to using that. Um, let's see. So I have in here also a link to information about Globus and I'll talk about Globus a little more here. Um, uh, one aspect of it that they call guest collections. There, it used to be called Globus sharing for those who are familiar with that. Um, but what it does is it allows people to share um, share data with unauthenticated users. So you can basically make it public uh, using Globus. And that means that somebody can can use Globus and doesn't have to have a NERSC login to get at your data. Um, and so this is kind of the perfect thing because it's like it's combining the power of Globus with the ability to make the, the files publicly shared. Uh, setting it up, it's pretty straightforward. You create a directory within your project directory and you call it G sharing. And then you file a ticket and service now and let us know that you've done that and that you want to share that as an endpoint with Globus. And then uh, somebody on the back end at NERSC will go in and configure our Globus endpoint to include your directory. And then they'll get back to you and say, okay, it's ready to go. And then you just go to globus.org, you fill out a very brief form that you'll get a link to, and it will uh, allow you to set the name that you want to give it. And then it'll show up like a, like a normal Globus endpoint within globus.org. So it's a great opportunity for, for sharing with the public. So the next opportunity is science gateways. So science gateways can be much more than simply sharing data files. Like, you know, they're, they're basically scientific resources for collaboration, and that can be all kinds of computer-supported cooperative work. Um, it could be sharing data, but it could also be sharing tools or sharing services, uh, whatever you want to build to to share with collaborators. Um, there's a group called sciencegateways.org that um, is basically uh, geared toward helping people build science gateways and understand how they can be useful. And if you check them out, though, they have a lot of useful information, although they're kind of geared toward the NSF uh, end of things. But uh, yeah, they have a lot of info about how to go about building them. So right at NERSC, how to go about building them, there's kind of two main approaches. Uh, one of them is just sharing a, a www directory on the community file system or on HPSS. 
um, if you give it that name and set it up with the right permissions, um, you can share uh, a website basically that's HTML and JavaScript. You can allow file downloads uh, and you can take advantage of client side programming and, and just keep things, keep all that, that uh, dynamicness on the client side when you, if you want to add dynamicness to your website. So you can use JavaScript APIs, things like the super facility API. So you can do a lot of pretty complicated stuff with it, but we're not allowing server side frameworks in this format anymore. Um, and the support level is eight by five. So as you know, we, we support it, but we're, you're not gonna get the kind of level of support that you might get from, you know, say like Amazon or, or maybe a Google site could even be a really good alternative as well if you want a higher level of support. The other alternative is build a service in our cloud-based system called Spin. So there you can use any server-side framework that you want. Uh, you can give it you know, a custom domain name if you, if you happen to own one. Um, you can connect directly to NERSC resources like databases and the community file system. And again, you can still use JavaScript APIs and like the super facility API. So all these things are still available. Um, but this system gives you a much more robust uh, infrastructure with the past couple of years, they've had 99% uptime. So that's been pretty darn reliable. Uh, but you are sort of self-administering the service. You have to build uh, the images that, that will be used through that system and ship it as containers. All right, so sharing a www directory. Uh, so you basically just set it up inside a project directory in the community file system, as long as you name it www and you give it the path between the, the top level project directory and your www directory, make sure those, those directories are all executable, then the web server at portal.nurse.gov or portalauth.nurse.gov will be able to reach that directory and it will serve those files as any regular uh, website. So, and then a little more about Spin. Spin is a cloud-based platform and it's based on Rancher 2. And what Rancher 2 gives us is orchestration, which means that, you know, it, it kind of deals with the, all the complexity of having a whole bunch of different Docker images run on different nodes. Um, so, I mean, this means that whatever runs is kind of ephemeral in the sense that you don't have state in between uh, deployments of it. So that has uh, a lot of pluses in, in terms of scaling and being able to just kind of restart a system anytime you want. Uh, it's a very flexible system, but you just have to be able to think of things as uh, an ephemeral service. Um, but you can, can build any x86 image, build it on a laptop with Docker, and you can ship it over. You can use the NERSC registry or just Docker Hub itself. And then you can run these things through the Rancher graphical user interface, which makes it really pretty straightforward to, to hook it up with the networking that you want and have it uh, make that service available. So Spin is meant for apps. It's not for computing, um, but it, it gives you access to databases. You can do workflow orchestration through it. You can run your own API servers to distribute data that way, um, or just anything you can think of that works um, as a service that's an ephemeral service. Um, there's lots of documentation, like in the docs.nurse.gov website, gives you a lot of info about SPIN. Um, and if you're interested in giving SPIN a try, we have a series of workshops. Um, we've been doing these for a while, and they are continuing through June, August. We have some in October and November, and there'll be more scheduled in the future as well. So keep an eye on that if you're at all interested. So that is it. Um, if anybody has any questions, I'd be happy to answer them. Yeah, I have a, a question. Um, one of the projects I'm going to be working on, I'm I'm generating a lot of simulation data using GeoSX, and um, I'm going to be keeping it at certain time points, but there'll be internal time points that are also generated. And I wanted to know if there's a way to like kind of archive those 
um, because they'll be pretty large and you know I can come back and get more data if I need it. I don't want to fill up CFS with you know a petabyte of data. Is there some place that's like not really used that you can kind of archive it and then like get what get the file you want later? Mm. Um, that's a good question. That is a, a area which we don't do super well currently. Um, if I'm understanding it correctly, and the issue is that that you you have the data and you want to be able to share it long term, but you you don't want to fill up CFS with it. Um, and for that, yeah, you'd have to. Yeah, it, it doesn't uh -huh. need to be. It's not even that I want to share it. It's more that like I want to be oh. able to get get back to it if I uh -huh. need it, it to resample it, basically. Oh, so okay. I, 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 it's going to take a lot of compute hours to generate mm -hmm. this data. I don't want to throw out all the points in between just because I don't think I need them now. But right. you know, you know, but I want to be able to get back to them if I need them. But I don't I want to, you know, use high performance, you know, file yeah. systems that are designed for like, you know, gigabyte access on the fly. I want to use something cheap that, you know, you don't care too much about if that's available. Right. And that's the case for HPSS then. That's tape yeah. archive, right? Yeah, What's that's that? the archive. That's okay. Definitely a place to consider. Um I don't know, you know, how much data you have. It, if that's going over your, your limit in HPSS, um, what I would do is maybe file a ticket on ServiceNow and kind of explain your predicament. You might be able to get more space if you need it. Okay. But well, yeah. Well, my my uh, my ERCAP uh, allocation is still in review right now, but I'm I'm just trying to figure out like how do I work that trade off between recomputing and just storing mm -hmm. the data. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So HPSS is is really optimized for storage. Um, you, you need to format your data. In some specific ways to put it in there correctly, so you're not loading it with a ton, a, with tons of small files, because that would be inefficient. Oh yeah, no, it'd be a but, big file, but yeah. yeah, okay, yeah. So there's a a bit of a, a related question in um, chat from Kochi. Can <laughs> Globus Guest be used with a HPSS or WW project directory? Uh, it's not set up currently. Hmm. I wonder if we could actually enable that. The www thing can definitely be used with HPSS, but the G sharing I think right now is limited to CFS. Right. Okay, thanks. Yeah, that's too bad. But it'd be really helpful for us to have. Uh, yeah, I didn't know about this global guest, global guest, but that's actually really useful for me and my colleagues because actually, I have another related question that uh, because when we publish papers, we sometimes have to put the data somewhere publicly accessible for in case, for example, readers want to reproduce or actually these days there's a really uh, journals that focused on data. Like for mm -hmm. example, this is the scientific data journal that's under the nature. Yeah. And then, but to publish, uh, paper or published data, we have to have store data in a uh, uh, data sent repository that, that meets some criteria. The old journals having pretty much have some same criteria like long term persistence mm -hmm. and then public right. access. And so, my related question is that is it, is it possible for NASC to expand a little bit on its like a data? Related service so that um, really to consider those criteria you know, set up by several high profile data journals. And then, mm -hmm. even better, if we have some framework to have some the, the DOIs on the data on us, because I am just about to publish paper, something half of that scope is to publish the data, but then I have to move data to somewhere I can get DOI, right. for example, and then, but because all the data is produced at NASC, so this data transfer is sort of a waste. Mm -hmm. And then, and yeah. then NASC already has really long, stable, you know, archive as HPSS. So I think it's really nice for everyone to have NASC to have a little more capability or play a role as data repository then, you know, we can, it's NASC has even more high profile paper mm -hmm. data publication from that. So what, what do you think about those 
uh, possibilities. Yeah, this is something we're actually looking into. Um, mm. So currently, and I would strongly suggest you do this, is you can get a DOI from anywhere and point it at directories mm. that are in NERSC. And the beautiful thing about a DOI is if you do end up having to move it elsewhere, then you can do that because you can just change where the DOI is pointing. Oh. So the DOI is consistent. Um, so you'll still be you know, following your data plan and, and keeping the data accessible to everyone. Mm -hmm. um, but we are also looking into the possibility of um, having a slightly different policies about how, uh, you know, like right now, if you have data that's shared through a website on NERSC and you cease to be a NERSC user, um, we will retain your data for a year. You know, we, we promise you at least that much. But it would, I think a lot of people are feeling that it would be nice to have more than that for something that's publicly shared. Mm -hmm. And especially if you have it, you know, published through a DOI, it'd be nice to keep that working without you having to, to change it. Um, I, so we I, are looking into that. One thing that I've seen that universities do is they will have like an alumni section that's, you know, forever that, you know, okay, you mm -hmm. were here and now you're not. So it's a little mm -hmm. different than the NERSC, but maybe a similar idea where you have active users and then just like retained data. Yeah, that's a cool thought. Yeah, thanks for that. Yeah. Oh yeah, so if actually I searched for how to get the DOI myself, but it's so, to me, it's very complicated. So if it's not that complicated and straightforward, it'd be very helpful if we have some NASC documentation has some page to explain some general procedure mm. or point mm -hmm. to some resources because again, mm -hmm. Many of my colleagues are generating huge amount of data at NERSC. So mm -hmm. it would be nice if you can get DOI the data at NERSC or like you said, or any, right. anywhere. Right, right. So currently what we're, we're generally telling people is, you know, whatever your home institution is, is usually the, the right place to go through for getting the DOI. Um, so all people's different home institutions will have different methods of doing that. Oh. If you happen to work for LBL, uh, there is a way to get one through the library system um, mm -hmm. that, that's pretty easy, pretty fast. Um, but generally, I mean, you want the DOI to be minted through a place that you have a long lasting relationship with so, so that you can get to it to make corrections, right? Mm -hmm. um, but mm -hmm. yeah, I mean, yeah. we definitely could be providing some extra information about that so that people can understand what their options are. That might be, yeah, quite helpful. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks. So, so there's another question in the chat. And I also see that uh, Stephen has his hand up. Uh, in the chat, is uh, is FileZilla supported for connecting with the DTNs? Oh. Um, so FileZilla can use our FTP upload service. Uh, it, it'll only allow for upload and not download. Um, and it's kind of funny because once you put something up there, you sort of the, because of the security features on it, you don't see what's in there. So it's it's a little it's a little weird. That that's the the mm -hmm. disrecommended currently disrecommended FTP file upload service. But yes, that is that is supported through that. Right, but Globus is a better. Globus is much better. Yes. Uh, Stephen. Hi, thanks for this info. Um, I have a, a tip, a request, and a question. Um, so the tip is first, I found um, Globus to be the most effective way of moving files even internally to NERSC. Ah. So like moving between Scratch and CFS, Globus is way faster than copy or rsync or something. So that's great. Um, the problem is it doesn't handle symlinks well. And so if we have symlinks in our tree of what we're trying to move around, it doesn't deal with those correctly. So the request is, I'm under the impression that NERSC has bought into Globus at a level that gets them like priority request on features. And so if NERSC could help get Globus to support symlinks, that would mm. be great. We would use Globus a lot more if it actually supported symlinks fully in the way that, um, and also file metadata. So if Globus was more of a drop-in replacement for rsync, we would use it more. So. Mm -hmm request to NERSC on that. And then the question is, um, within our collaboration, we sometimes want to create like a directory for science working groups where any user can come in and like create a new file or create a new directory. But to do that, we have to grant write permission 
which the, to the group, which also means that users can accidentally delete each other's files. Um, and we haven't found a good solution for how to manage that where we like create the ability for someone to add something, but not step on someone else and accidentally remove someone else. Do you have a right. best practice hmm. suggestion for that? Oh, that's tricky. Cause if you're giving them I, right, yeah, they can do I that. Do. Um, there's a, oh. in Unix, there's a thing called a sticky bit, um, which is the T on, on chmod. So if you give the full permission with the T that it gives the ability of people to create things, but they can't remove them unless they owned it. So if you look into the sticky bit, you might be able to find a solution around that. It's used a lot in, in Linux uh, for temp directories. Mm, yeah, that, that would be a equivalent example, yeah. So it, it would be a sticky bit right on the top level directory? Yes. So to, yeah, take a look at the at chmod sticky bit and look at the permissions for sticky bit. That that's that's the purpose of that is for people to be able to create files and folders, but not be able to delete other people's files and folders. Okay, that sounds what I'm looking for. Thanks. That's a handy tip, uh, and I think I've used yeah. that one before. Oh, um, today you learned. <laughs> yeah. Another, another <laughs> today I learned. Um, so, so Stephen's comment was interesting. That was one of the, the questions I was going to ask because I, I remember a little while ago, uh, it used to be the case that actually moving data within NERSC at, w via Globus was faster than most other methods. And, and was that still true? And it, and it sounds like the answer is yes. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It turns out there's actually more movement within NERSC uh, if you'll get all the Globus traffic, more of it is within NERSC than anywhere else. Mm. Why, why is it faster? Is it using some different protocol that's more efficient? My understanding is that it monitors the traffic and dynamically optimizes how many threads are participating in it. Okay. Um, yeah, I think it's it's more about the number of connections. But I mean, it's it's been well thought out. I'm sure when they put it together, they they mm. optimized it in every way they could find. So, and another a uh, couple of comments. Um, I noticed that, uh, and it gave a pointer to the Unix file permissions page in NERSC's mm -hmm. docs, and. I think historically that has has been our most visited page. I think um, Google or something uh, sends users there when they ask for file permissions. So it's, so it's actually a really uh, popular page. Um, the other thing that was somewhere between a, a question and a comment, um, whereas we we also have for most of our file systems uh, ACLs, <laughs> and so you can do quite. Um, fine-grained permissions management True. with uh, set fackle and uh, set fackle and get fackle. I, I don't know if uh, and it wants to say anything about that in terms of sort of recommendations. It is a it is a little more complicated to use. Yeah, that is definitely an option. Um, I think for most groups that it's not really necessary, but. Yeah, sometimes it gives you a little more granularity and sometimes that's actually what you need. So, yeah. Uh, so I think that's all the questions that I've seen in chat. Were there any other questions in there? In-person questions or, or what do you call it? Direct over Zoom questions. And if not, we are coming actually close to the end of our um, slot. So I'd like to say thanks, Annette, for th that was a really informative and uh, helpful talk. So, yeah, I definitely learned a few things and <laughs> hopefully that means uh, others did too. And thanks people for um, insightful questions as well. Yeah, that was great. So just before we finish up, let's uh, share this screen again.
and finish up with uh, a couple of last items, which is a quick look at last month's numbers. Uh, at the moment, there's a very limited set of numbers. It's really just the outages. Um, yeah, there's interest in, in other numbers, which are still coming around to, to yeah, how to actually uh, do that. So we did have a few outages in May. Uh, Corey had uh, two, two incidents on top of its scheduled maintenance and uh, Perlmutter had a few scheduled maintenances and a few uh, unscheduled incidences, which uh, uh, fortunately were mostly short. And finally, a quick look at what's coming up. So uh, we have uh, penciled in for next month, a talk from uh, Bjorn from NERSC about uh, interactive HPC workflows for experimental user facilities. Um, and also kind of in our, in our coming up list, but not actually scheduled yet, is a bit about HPSS interfaces. Uh, also, we are very interested in hearing more like inter talks you know, from our users about, about the work that you're doing. I mean, you know, nurse users are doing really, really interesting work. Um, and yeah, I think it'd be uh, uh, great to see a little of, uh, of what uh, some of our users are doing. So if you've got a lightning talk or you know, would like to nominate somebody that you know um, it has, has something that uh, they would like to present that you know, is uh, you know, an interesting thing for, for nurse users to see. Um, please let us know. Uh, these slides are actually, they should already be on the website and then that, that should enable you to just sort of click that link on the slide. Actually, I, can, uh, I, I had a chat. question. No, I can't. Uh, uh, yep. when, do you know when the, the GPUs are gonna start um, actually uh, allocating against our allocation? I don't believe that's been actually decided yet. Okay, it's still, it's still up in the air. And, and the other question I had is, are the CPU only nodes on Perlmutter? Do they charge against your allocation already? No, um, so I think the charging will, will be all at once when it, when okay. it happens. Got it. Um, for, for, for both types of nodes. But um, so, so the CPU nodes were still kind of in the process of integrating those and um, you know, bringing the system up. So, uh, so they are there and we encourage you to, to try them out and let us know about any issues that you find. Um, but also remember that it's, it's not a production system yet. It's still being brought up. So there might be some, yeah. you know, disruptions and things might not work smoothly the first time, which, which is partly, you know, why we encourage you to, to try them out so that we can learn about or you know, discover the things that need some more tweaking. Right. Thank you. No worries. All right, at that, we're basically at the top of the hour. Oh, uh, let's see if I can. No, it looks like I can't uh, paste that link into the chat. <laughs> um, uh, I think I can. Here we go. So there's now a link in the Zoom chat. So. Uh, yeah, if you have a, a topic that you're interested in or would like to present or you know, something to, to nominate, uh, please let us know about it via this form. Thanks all for joining us today. The uh, slides and recording will be on the website kind of soon. And uh, thanks again, Annette, for a great um, overview of sharing. And we'll see you all in the coming month. Yeah, thank you so much. Thanks, guys. Take care. Thanks, Joe.